Sunday Papers on Off The Ball. Now you're welcome, Max. So we are reviewing the Sunday Papers. We have George Hamilton with us, RT commentator extraordinaire. We have Tommy Martin as well, anchor at Virgin Media's uh, football coverage. I'll run you through the headlines first of all. Leinster leave it late is the lead in the Mail on Sunday. Picture Jordan Larmer punching the air, Munster 10, Leinster 13. Jordan Larmer celebrating his late try to win the game for Leinster. And then beneath that, it's Shane McGrath in the Mail on Sunday here. Cautious reopening raises questions for sport. This is on the back of Neil Martin's interview yesterday with Brendan O'Connor, which, if you heard, had a few chilly moments, was not the most optimistic of pictures being painted. It won't surprise you, I'm sure, but uh, the Taoiseach admitted significant restrictions will remain in place for at least the first half of the year. So Shane McGrath makes the point here that that will have knock-on effects on any hopes of fans returning to Irish stadia in any significant numbers in 2021. It is the news that Irish sporting bodies had been fearing, says uh, Shane. The Observer is next here in front of me, Heartbreakers. This is Cheltenham yesterday in the FA Cup. Cheltenham's Alfie May threatens a major shock, but late goals from Foden, Jesus and Torres secure a 3-1 win for Manchester City. Picture there of uh, Man City players celebrating Torres's goal. Sunday, independent then. They go with Jordan Larmer, about to score his try. Uh, Larmer's killer blow, and then Brendan Fanning writing the match report here. Brendan will be on with us around 3 o'clock with Matt Williams. Uh, Hugo Keenan shines as Ireland coach sees plenty of reasons to be cheerful at Thoman Park. Uh, beneath that, if you hadn't seen it, Arsenal. Uh, the holders bow out as City survived Cheltenham's scare. Sunday Times, a uh, similar picture to the Mail on Sunday of Jordan Larmer. Joy for Jordan. Uh, late Larmer try hands Leinster win at Munster. And then Frank Lampard, Chelsea in action at the moment in the FA Cup against Luton. They're currently 2-1 up. Uh, Lampard tells squad, run or you don't play. So uh, Frank Lampard uh, reckons it's pretty simple right now. Chelsea work rate is their biggest issue. So run or you don't play is his message. Sunday Mirror Sport, uh, building up to Manchester United, Liverpool in the FA Cup this evening. Uh, Klopp cop out. Pool boss hints that his long-term future is in doubt. I think the quote this is all based around, and it's it's in other places besides the uh, mirror. He said, uh, short term and quite easy to excite, but then in the long term it's not easy. It's hard to know if we're reading too much into that, but um, a few of the papers had that interpretation at the press conference, so I guess there's something in it potentially. Uh, the Sun have a race for uh, Deo. Upa Meccano, who plays for uh, Leipzig, by all accounts, a really good player. I haven't seen too much of him. I heard uh, uh, Didi Hamann talking about him, saying he was a really brilliant prospect, 22 years of age. So he's got a £38 million pound release clause, which can be activated in the summer. And it seems that, for obvious reasons, both Manchester United and Liverpool are in the hunt. And then finally, uh, Sunday World here. It's again building up to Manchester United Liverpool in the FA Cup fourth round at five o'clock. Uh, Bruno Fernandes, Bruno up a storm. Bruno has vowed to pile the misery on Liverpool. Uh, I, what he said was, if you want to win the cup, then you have to beat the biggest teams. So we have a chance now to beat one of the best teams left in the FA Cup. And then beneath that, uh, Gooners or Gunners, Arsenal out of the FA Cup. Tommy Martin, good afternoon to you. Hi, Joe. Great How to have you? you with us. Yeah, good, good, good. And George Hamilton, you're very welcome to the paper review. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Joe. So, uh, where will we start? I mean, there's lots, lots going on, loads of good stuff in the papers, I think, today. Uh, broad strokes, Tommy, we could have picked out another five, six, seven, eight pieces to the ones we're going to try and get round to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think there's a, a big theme around the horse racing stuff. Um, there's a lot of Man U Liverpool stuff that's uh, interesting because both clubs are poised in interesting places at the moment. Um, and then there's other more individual stuff. There's a great Joe Brawley piece with Michael Dara McCauley, uh, which I initially sort of brushed over, but you've brought our attention to it. It's probably the piece I most enjoyed uh, reading this morning. Uh, and then lots more nice uh, Jerry Kiernan uh, tributes as well. I must say I was in danger of brushing by the Joe Brawley piece and Michael Dara McCauley as well until I saw Kieran Cunningham tweeting about it. And I thought, OK, I'll give that a look. He's a regular mm. paper reviewer guest. And it didn't disappoint. George, did you get around to look at this? Joe Brawley talking about... Is, is, uh, yeah. I'm so surprised at you that you don't read Joe Brawley every week. No, well, uh, I, 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 do, I, I do, I do, I do, I do. I like a spikier headline on my Brawley pieces before I, when they really, yeah, really grab I know. It's, I mean, <laughs> I might... I might 
I, I might have passed it by uh, because because of the subject matter, because uh, my eye was taken by all the UEFA stuff on this new European Super League and so on. Uh, and I'd have got round to it, you know, mid-afternoon, feed up, cup of tea. Yeah. And then I'd have read Joe Brawley. But uh, because because of this, I, I read it pretty, one of the first things I read. And I find it absolutely, as always with Joe, absolutely fascinating. Great piece. Great piece. Uh, by, uh, the, 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 just the, the whole business and how it started with turning up for an all Ireland final with your without your boots, you know, it seems so so ludicrous. But the, then that's life. And Joe Joe's very good at finding that kind of angle. And I think that uh, he did it spot on uh, with that piece today. Uh, this is on the back of Michael Darren McCauley, who has retired, of course. So I didn't realise Brawley and Michael Darren are obviously friendly and keep in touch. And it starts Crow Park, September 18th, 2011, quarter past three. Uh, Pat Gilroy standing in the middle of the changing room. The boys are togged out, ready to go, etc. Suddenly, Michael Darren McCauley, who's still in his trainers, uh, catches Pat's eye and nodded him towards the toilets. Pat followed him in. What is it? I've forgotten my boots. F off, Michael. Seriously, I have. Jesus Christ, Michael. What size are you? 12. I'm 13, said Pat. They'll have to do you. <laughs> and so he took Pat Gilroy's boots. I had never heard this story. I can't believe that. Uh, so he took... Uh, Gilroy's boots and uh, do not say a word to anyone, said Gilroy. The midfielder went on to put in, writes Brawley, a monumental performance at midfield as Dublin won their first All-Ireland in 16 years. As Gilroy later joked, it made no difference to him anyway because in those days he never uh, kicked a ball. And Tommy, what becomes apparent is that Gilroy and subsequent Dublin managers uh, loved what Michael Dara brought to the equation. He was the keen man, he changed everything. His attitude was the spearhead of the transformation from losers to winners, said Gilroy. He was unbreakable. He ran at every bleep test. He trained like he played. He destroyed his markers with his stamina, his tackling, his quick hands, etc. Uh, Brawley has a, <laughs> a brilliant line on Michael Dara. When he played, his limbs appeared to move independently <laughs> of each other, ungainly as a man running in water, his head waggling from side to side as though he were dodging punches. When he soloed, every other touch was a high catch. Yet, his was the very heart of yeah. the Dublin revival. That's a, it's a brilliant description of him. And, and like it's, it's um, the case with any good piece of writing that you, you it immediately conjures the image of, of, of the person that's describing. And that was him. And yet, as you know, the piece, I, like, I actually was taken aback, the anecdotes about Michael Darren McCauley's um, uh, what, what you know that stuff with the boots and there's a great one to come to in a, in a minute later on but it's that that bit you just read there about how Gilroy said he was the key man for the Dublin revival is is a really um extraordinary re revealing thing for Gilroy to say because that was such a seismic turnaround in a team's fortunes and we're still you know a decade later still being played out so what a tribute um to a guy's impact to have that but then balance that with the fact that how completely nonplussed he was by his, his like his ability as a player his importance to Dublin by the whole game of Gaelic football you know it's, uh, Brody says successive Dublin managements realised early on that he didn't know anything about Gaelic football or footballers unless they were part of his group he had no interest before they played Tyrone in April 2010 um, he was told he was marking Sean Kavanagh and it quickly became apparent he had absolutely no idea who Sean Kavanagh was and remember, this is April 2010 when Sean Kavanagh was a three-time All-Ireland winner <laughs> by that stage and I think possibly Footballer of the Year in 2008. So Ray Boyne, who was Gilroy's number two, sorry, Ray Boyne who was doing the clips at the time, I had to download images and say, this, this is Sean Kavanagh, <laughs> this is who you're marking. But th there's another anecdote then later on, a bit like the one about the boots. It's the Tuesday before the 2011 final after the last training session, Gilroy has said to the lads, no golf, no runs, complete rest, uh, do nothing between now and Sunday. But as he was leaving Parnell Park, Macaulay tapped Gilroy's window. What is it, Michael? Look, Pat, I have to play a basketball game on Saturday evening. You're joking me. No, it's a mate's game. We've only 10, so I have to play. I can't let them down. Gilroy says, I could just see he would be very upset if I said no. And I said, OK, just don't tell anyone, Michael. And that was Michael. But I think what what's... And then the killer line is when Gilroy gave him permission, Macaulay said, thanks, Pat. I'm not really into the guy anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but the key is that, like, as a, great, as, a, as a good manager, to manage the individual and not, not lay down the law, a, a blanket law across the whole squad. And obviously, Gilroy had the, the, you know, the intelligence to know that you manage, manage Macaulay 
uh, in an individual way, the, the way he needed to be. Yeah, there's, there's a line in there as well. I say uh, Joe's quoting uh, Colm O'Rourke. <laughs> they were talking about would Michael Dara be Player of the Year, and Colm O'Rourke uh, said it's a bit like the Kit Kat ad, you know, with that band. And the fella says, "You can't play. You look awful. You'll go a long way." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he did, and he has, and, w- and what a career. Yeah, there's such what a, a career. But what about the end? What about the end of the story as yeah. well? His, his bike spin. His bike has been stuck. Joe rings him up yesterday, he says, to uh, just to, to get a feel for his personality again as the piece is going in the paper. And he, there's noise in the background. He says, where are you? He says, I'm on the bike. He says, well, where are you? I'm riding around Stevens Green. My bike was nicked, so I'm on a Dublin bike. <laughs> and he's, he's getting his cycling in by, by hiring a Dublin bike and doing laps of Stevens Green. Yeah. Um, how many have you done? <laughs> a fair few. I hung up, as I always do, smiling <laughs> and shaking my head. Pointless trying to talk to him about yeah. football and a bit like he is in the pitch he seems to be all action as well like Broly recounts a previous drink with him having a pint with him and Michael Dara spent the whole hour stretching with using an umbrella to do it you know unselfconsciously <laughs> stretching his back out at different points so the whole thing is just it's kind of Roy the Rovers unconventional uh, romantic George and these are all the things people are drawn to Absolutely, uh, you couldn't you couldn't fail to like Michael Darren McCauley after reading that, mm. because it, it's just it's it's the uh, the I don't know the swan. I mean, I'm just off the air with the music program and lyric and thinking of, you know the the ugly duckling who turns into a swan. You know, it's this this is Michael Darren's uh, football career that it should never happen, but it did. Of course, it did because he was so good at what he did, mm. uh, and it's a great piece. And as I say, I'm surprised you didn't read Joe Broly first because he's, he's, he's <laughs> such 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 an important part of my my Sunday reading. Is that right? No, don't worry. We get to him every Sunday. We get to him. It's more that this it's it's such a lovely piece, and it's on the bottom of page nine. You'd very easily miss it, yeah. you know, because there's other very compelling pieces mm-hmm. in the paper. It was almost that as much as. Anything. So you uh, you enjoy a Sunday sitting back with the papers, feed up, George, and reading all, about all sports. I, I do it, anything at all, um, and I, I find that the, the you know the papers, the Indo, I think is a terrific sports section, and the, and the Sunday Times too. Uh, and I get most of my value out of those because those are my two go to of a of a regular Sunday. And I enjoy Tommy Connell on the back page as well. Uh, uh, not Tommy. I enjoy Tommy Connell. Sorry, I enjoy him and Sweeney on the back page. I got the them mixed up there. Apologies, guys. Uh, because they're they're two that I, I would also go to as well, and Kimmage, of course, is what we'll, we'll be talking about uh, later on too. But it, it, I do I enjoy that. It's, it's generally a, a walk, a, a big walk with the dogs, the Jack Russells, and then and then the papers uh, at this time of the year. Of course, the afternoon's not so long. Mm. Uh, there's plenty of time to read before dinner. And a snooze. Oh, it's nice, isn't it? <laughs> and it's, uh, the snooze is after dinner. <laughs> <laughs> How come you've never commentated on GAA, or have I missed this somehow? No, 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 no. I, 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 it just never kind of happened because um, uh, my contemporary is Jer Canning, of course, so we started off more or less at the same time and he went down one track and I went down the other. And uh, I suppose when we became established at, w- at, at what we did, you know, there was really any room for me to go into the, the GAA. It's, it's some, something that, that uh, I've, you know, I've, I've followed uh, and I'm, I'm interested in and I've been to all Ireland finals and I've cheered on down. Uh, that's a while ago. Um, so... <laughs> but uh, it, it just never kind of happened. But I did. My, one of one of my uh, favourite memories is actually being the uh, match day reporter with the Antrim hurling team in 1989, uh, when I met up with them in Casement Park on the Friday night, and I followed them down on the Saturday, and I was with them before and after on the Sunday, and at the post match dinner in Malahide, and spent half the game beside Big Niall Patterson <laughs> in the Antrim goal as <laughs> Tipperary bore down on him again and again and again. But that that was one of one of my favourite memories. And the end. great great guys that that Antrim hurling team who just couldn't believe what they got that they got to the All Ireland um, and were were in no way upset uh, that that Tipperary became the champions. Yes. To jump to page eleven of the Sunday Independent, I've had a feeling this week. I suspect a lot of people have had. I wish I had somehow in my time had a pint with Jerry Kiernan. And, uh, you know, what a remarkable man he seems to have been. I didn't know him at all. He was on the show uh, once we did a 15-minute chat about athletics one time or other, but I didn't know him. Eamon Sweeney, uh, one of many this week to have penned a glowing tribute to what Kiernan represented on the track and off the track. Uh, there was a real greatness about Jerry Kiernan, greatness and honesty and enthusiasm. We, we, we really will miss him, is how he uh, finishes the piece. He begins it by saying, Jerry Kiernan has two things above all. He was an honest man and he was an enthusiast. Uh, those qualities seem essential for a world-class roadrunner. All those punishing miles leave no room for self-deception. They must know exactly what they're capable of and must love what they're doing or the demands would just become unbearable. 
and he uh, paints a picture of uh, Kiernan very much in keeping with the ones we, we've heard all week. Tommy, anything jump out to you about Eamon's uh, piece on Kiernan? Oh, uh, like, uh, just the this, this stuff about Eamon's, uh, about uh, Jerry Kiernan this week has been, you know, really, I mean, it's dreadfully so sad, so sad um, when, when the news broke just a couple of days ago. Um, the tributes have just been so beautiful, you know. I think anybody should dig out um, Kieran McGeehan's interview with with you guys a few days ago. Um, Sean McGoldrick has has a kind of a you could say it's a bit of a encapsulation of that piece because he speaks speaks to Kieran McGeehan just below Eamon's uh, piece in the Sunday Indo, um, talking about how Jerry was a father figure to her and like the, what like. It's just brilliant, um, and it's, it's actually worth digging out the audio from the interview the other day about how he sat down with her, was was so honest, um, and said, and you know, she she had admitted early in the interview that like she just wanted someone to tell her what to do because her ankle was in bits and she didn't know if she could run again. And he said, I'm "Not sure what I'm going to do with you." And he had that honesty that Eamon Sweeney um, said that I, I'm I'm afraid myself that I might tell you the wrong thing, and you know, but something about that whole. Honesty about her personality that seemed to chime with athletes, and there's so many pieces. I I, I know it's um, the Sunday papers we're looking at, but the Irish Times is a kind of a weekend sports section, so it's it's well worth. It's still in the shops today. The sports section yesterday had two great pieces. Uh, Ian O'Reardon's piece on uh, him as a coach, and also a piece about him as a teacher. Um, which is written by somebody called uh, Fergus O'Farrell, who was obviously a past pupil of St. Bridges Boys School, Boys School, and his stories about the, the approach to teaching that uh, Jerry had. You know, he was a maverick. The curriculum didn't always suit him, so he'd often go off piste for geography. He expounded on the Aegean and Adriatic seas, drawing on Greek mythology to bring imagery and, and drama to the lesson. Can you imagine being a student in that class? And he would task uh, the kids with finding out the meaning of a, a difficult word. And if you were successful, he would give you a T-shirt he'd worn the previous week at a road race, or had won the previous week at a road race or a track meet. Once we had to find out the antonym for Orient, in the days before the internet, it was pretty hard for 12-year-olds to figure out that it's Occident. But half a dozen boys came back with the correct answer. We all wanted that T-shirt. And the last line... Uh, if you ever come across someone who went to St. Bridges Corners, Cornell's Court, ask them who the best teacher they ever had was. Ten out of ten will say Mr. Kiernan. Mm. So, again, just I, I think a lot of the pieces about what um, you know, Kier, Kier McGeehan said something in her interview that like he changed her life. And you know, look, not all of us would be like George and have the uh, the honour to live on in eternity thanks to our words, but. Some, someone like Jerry Kiernan is clearly going to have impacted people's lives. And Kieran McGeehan said that you know she wants to coach herself and give something back now when she finishes in the way that Jerry did. And you know it's again, as as I said, very sad, but but really a really rounded person in and a person with such depth and. and, and a, 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 a multitude. You know that that old Walt Whitman line of. You know, the man contained multitudes. Well, Jerry Kieran and certainly reading all the tributes over the over the week, um, certainly certainly was that. Yeah, and you put that beautifully. He, he was, in there. He was yeah. very much a sorry, Tommy and and uh, Joe. He was very much a, a human being. You know, there was so many sides to Jerry. Jerry wanted the best out of everything that he did. He wanted to enjoy it to the full. He wanted to maximise his potential. Eamon Sweeney makes the point in terms of his athletic career and, and how he ran. Uh, I knew him quite well as a, as a panelist in our programs and uh, I would have met him from time to time uh, and one of the places I met him funny enough was in Barcelona airport because he was a great fan of Barcelona football club as well as having the, the connections with Lake Garda in, in Italy and uh, the thing, thing about Jerry was he, if it was a big game and he could get to it at all he would because that was just it was there and he wanted to be at it and that was Jerry he wanted to be involved in everything he could be involved in he wanted to live life to the full um, and I, I, he pretty much did. And he, he took he took great delight in everything. Again, another point that Eamon Sweeney made in his piece, he took as much delight in somebody winning an Irish title as in somebody winning an Olympic gold medal, or John Tracy at the, at, at the marathon in Los Angeles, when Jerry himself uh, finished a very commendable ninth. You know, that Jerry Kiernan w wanted to get across how much dedication it took uh, for somebody uh, like Siobhan Everson to win an Irish national title uh, than uh, somebody winning an Olympic title. It was a major, major, major achievement. And Jerry saluted that. And I love the way he did. And 
We did Falula Britain, Falula McCormick and the, the European cross countries. And Jerry took such great pleasure out of that because here was the girl from Kilcool who had risen to the very top. Uh, and, and, it, and Jerry just loved the fact that that had happened and that she had become the first to, to retain that title in the way that she did. It was He, he was a great guy and he, and he lived his sport and he loved his sport and it's terribly sad that he's gone. Yeah. So what kind of company was he, George, if you were sitting around having a cup of coffee? Uh, <laughs> it might have been a cup of coffee. I'll, I'll tell you something I probably shouldn't tell you. From the Barcelona airport store, when we bumped into him, he had a glass of wine in front of him at 11 in the morning. And I said, Jerry, that's a bit early to get started. Jerry said, I cannot stand flying. And the only way I could get on a plate is with two glasses of Merlot inside me. <laughs> 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 he was a human being. <laughs> yeah, it certainly seems that way. I, I, I think, um, like, most of us obviously knew him as as the pundit, so uh, the analyst, as, as, as George said, over so many years, brilliant analyst. And somebody who wouldn't be like athletics wouldn't be my first sport you know it may, might be something i'd only come to at the big championships he the great i always think i always say there's two th two key criteria for an anal analyst or pundit if you like to have is to have something to say and to be able to say it and like jerry kieran always struck me as having that so he you know he, he had that ability to bring in the people who maybe weren't the athletics fans tell them what this race what was going to happen, who the people that were most important to look out for, what would likely play out, and afterwards explain what had happened, who had done well, who had underperformed. Uh, and, and, you know, just a brilliant analyst in that, set, in, in that sense. And as Eamon Sweeney says, sincerity was accompanied by considerable intelligence. No pundit was as resistant to the idea of dumbing down. His analysis was not just accurate, it was also articulate and literate to an extent which con the sport could be spoken about as intelligently as anything else. He must have been a terrific teacher. Yeah, he really, really was a stunningly good pundit. He was one of those that just uh, silenced the room if there were several people watching together. If he was talking, everybody stopped and watched. Mm. You know, he's in that bracket, and there are a few we could all name who are, and he most certainly was. On the GAA thing, because I always thought he was totally right about the GAA thing. You know, like mm. it was this thing. So he said that not all GA players are as fit as Olympians. Um, like, it was just so patently true. He said, um, and, and uh, Eamon Sweeney makes the point, sure, like, it's obvious. Look at the gap between Dublin and that of every other county. But uh, as Sweeney says, I remember getting an email from an old neighbour in Kerry who said he was fed up seeing people claim Jerry was biased against Gaelic games because he'd probably been no good at them. Whereas the email said he was a terrific footballer as a youngster. He just preferred running. So... That was kind of an interesting point to make. Uh, that piece in the Irish Times yesterday was, was gorgeous as well. I, I read it. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. You could almost taste, Tommy, the atmosphere in the classroom as, oh. as, as Kiernan <laughs> awoke the, the, the passion for learning that people naturally have and the competitive instinct and who's going to find the adenum for Orient. Now, I had to, mm. I had to search what an adenum <laughs> was yesterday. I was like, what's an adenum? <laughs> Uh, Antonym. Antonym. Yeah, there you go. There you go. So this is, and I'm like, geez, Kiernan, thank you. And you know, that's my word for the weekend to yeah. to nail down. And God, what a classroom to be a part of. Oh, exactly. Yeah, I think you know, it's um, dead poet society territory. Yes. And it comes back to what I said about the, uh, there's actually a really nice piece. Uh, there's been a lot. It's um, uh, more last week's story now about Eamon Ryan, the um, Cork ladies football legendary coach who passed away last week, Shane McGrath in the mail, it tied into his sort of impact in the um, development of, of women's sport in general. But but it struck me um, reading and listening to the stuff about Jerry this week is that a bit like Eamon Ryan, somebody whose impact went way beyond the narrow confines between the sideline, you know, impact on people's lives, on them as on, on the whole people. Um, and the classroom stuff, it's worth digging out that piece from the Times yesterday. Yeah. You know, it is, as you say, you can just imagine yourself being enthralled by this. Imagine yeah. sixth class, boy, is, you know, brilliant. brilliant yes. stuff. hands in the air. Sir, 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 sir. That kind of a vibe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we'll take a very short break. We're going to pick things up with George Hamilton and Tommy Martin. Sign up for News Talk Extra. Our email newsletter straight to your inbox newstalk.com slash extra at Volkswagen Financial Services our solutions are expertly engineered to put you in the driving seat choose the flexibility of PCP low cost HP finance or the convenience of leasing 
Add extras like servicing and maintenance plans. For Volkswagen, Audi, Skoda, Seat or Volkswagen commercial vehicles, discover financing options that match your needs and your budget. Talk to your local dealer or visit vwfs.ie slash affordability. Volkswagen Financial Services. Affordability engineered for you. Finance provided by Volkswagen Financial Services Ireland. Subject to lending criteria, terms and conditions apply. Welcome to Go Loud Jazz, the new home for jazz music in all its forms. Big band, bebop, smooth, and everything in between. Featuring a mix of new tunes and famous tracks by legendary artists, from Monk and Davis, Parker and Coltrane, to Ella and Billy. Go Loud Jazz. Fascinating rhythms. Download the Go Loud app now for free. Go Loud. Podcasts, radio, and music to your ears. Get the latest News Talk podcasts at Newstalk.com and on the News Talk app. To keep well over the days and weeks ahead, it's good to make a plan. Try to include daily exercise outdoors. It can really improve your mood. So wrap up, head for a run, get on the bike, or just go for a walk within the distance allowed. And always stay two metres apart. Make your plan today to keep well. Find more ideas at sportireland.ie. Psychology, performance analysis, sports therapy and coaching all contribute to elite performance in sport. At Portobello Institute, we offer full-time and blended learning honours degrees in each of these sporting disciplines. Affordable and accessible online study, small group lectures and practicals are now enrolling at Portobello Institute. So talk to an expert about our full-time and blended learning sports degree courses at our virtual open sessions. Visit portobelloinstitute.com for details. What a time to turn 17. Months in your prime on pause, classrooms gone, training gone, summer slipped by. No face-to-face, let alone the shift. And don't even start on the leaving. Everything upturned, hard lessons learned. But sit and dwell? Never. No matches to play, but what matters remains. Staying focused, staying sharp, standing together. A united front for the future, however it plays out. Times like these teach you everything you need to know about yourself. The Electric Ireland GAA Minor Championships might be on hold, but our support is still major. In the real world, we know it's the customers you keep that keep you in business. Over 70% of Liberty Car Insurance customers stay with Liberty Insurance when renewal time comes around. That doesn't happen by accident. Switch at libertyinsurance.ie and see why so many people stay. Liberty Insurance. Ready for the real world. 74.9% of Liberty Insurance private motor customers renewed between the 1st of January and 30th of June 2020. Acceptance criteria, terms and conditions apply. Liberty Seguris, Compania de Seguris, Arreas Seguris, SAA trading as Liberty Insurance is authorised by the General Directorate of Insurance and Pension Funds in Spain and is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland for conduct of business rules. At Bank of Ireland, you don't have to talk face to face. Our mortgage team are happy to talk FaceTime to FaceTime and give you all the info you need, from how to get started to how much to save. FaceTime our mortgage team to talk about a personalised mortgage that's right for you. When you're ready to make a move, we're ready to make it with you. Bank of Ireland. Begin. Lending criteria, terms and conditions apply. Over 18s only. Mortgage approval subject to assessment of suitability and affordability. Bank of Ireland Mortgage Bank trading as Bank of Ireland Mortgages is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Get more for free with DID. Free delivery on big screen TVs 50 inches and over. Free delivery on all vacuums, fryers and coffee machines. Plus, free delivery on all large appliances over 299. T's and C's apply. Visit did.ie to find out more. Thank you for shopping Guaranteed Irish with DID Electrical. How long is too long when talking about the value of your investments? Well, if you're still holding cash, it could already be too long. At Davy, we think the one thing you shouldn't leave too long is a conversation with us. By talking to one of our trusted advisors now, we can help you find a solution that works better for your financial and investment plans. Let's start the conversation. Call us now or visit davy.ie forward slash cash. Davy, it's not just business, it's personal. Janie Davy, trading as Davy, is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. We take our responsibilities personally. Listen back to your favourite News Talk shows at Newstalk.com and on the News Talk app. Across Ireland. Across Ireland. This is the Imro Radio Awards National Station of the Year. 
This is News Talk. It's two o'clock. Good afternoon. I'm Adrian Harmon. The Minister for European Affairs says it's too early to say if Ireland will be able to meet its vaccination targets by the end of March. It's after AstraZeneca said deliveries of its soon-to-be-approved jab will be 60% less than planned in the next two months due to a production glitch. A meeting between the drug maker and EU officials is expected tomorrow. Minister for European Affairs Thomas Byrne says plans to vaccinate 700,000 people by March are still being worked on. I mean, we have a vaccine task force that's looking at this at the moment. We don't know what the increase in Pfizer will be from the 15th of February either. So that is another side. Johnson & Johnson as well, it's undetermined yet as to when that will be approved. That will be another game changer so that there is hope on the horizon. A public health advisor in England and Scotland says Ireland should introduce a testing system for leaving cert students. Professor Devry Schridar says it would be the safest way of bringing about a return to in-class learning. She also says the community positivity rate should be under 5 percent before schools are reopened. Ireland is currently at 10.3 percent. Professor Schrader says holding the traditional Leaving Cert exam in a hall would also be a bad idea. The only thing I would say is and you have to bring in testing in some way because we know older kids are basically mini adults and so if you want to do that in a way that's as safe as possible then you need to be testing children quite regularly to get them back in. But would I say it's a good idea in that kind of level of community transmission to have 50 kids in a hall with no ventilation? Probably not. €245,000 worth of cocaine has been seized in County Limerick. Guardi made the discovery after they stopped and searched a car in Raheen at around th- half three yesterday afternoon. A guard vehicle was damaged during the course of the operation. A man in his 30s was arrested at the scene and is being held at Henry Street Guard Station. And Met Erin says icy stretches, sleet and snow will remain throughout the day. Status yellow snow ice warning has been extended for the country until 7pm. The forecasters also issued a status yellow low temperature warning which will take effect from 7 p.m. and run until 10 tomorrow morning. It's two minutes past two. News Talk Weather. Thanks to the AA, you can find our best discounts on car insurance online. Go to the AA.ie. Cold with uh, wintry showers along with some sunny spells developing. Highest temperatures of just one to four degrees. And now you're up to date on News Talk. The Sunday Papers on Off the Ball. Now, you're welcome back. So we're reviewing the Sunday papers here on Sundays Off the Ball. Delighted to say we have George Hamilton with us and Tommy Martin as well. Tom is listening and he's out for his walk. He says, lads, give me that opposite of Orient business again, please. Uh, antonym. See, I would have said opposite as well. I've got to be honest. I wouldn't have, I would, I wouldn't have been an antonym man, but I'm going to try and become one. Uh, the antonym to Orient is occident. O-C-C-I-D-E-N-T. Occident, which is a great word. That was new on me. Occident. 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 Am I right, George? Occident. Yeah, Occident. 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 Was that new on you, or did you all know that? I do crosswords, Joe. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's a great. It's a great way to find find words that uh, you would never find otherwise. Yes, I must. Uh, I must start because uh, that was new on me. So. <laughs> There we go. Don't beat it's yourself. Allowed. It's allowed. It's allowed. Look, listen. No one knows everything. Jerry Kiernan's still teaching, so um, there's some really great pieces. People can uh, get stuck into them. Uh, let's turn to the horse racing situation because this is very serious this week, and uh, others, Paul Kimmage, David Walsh, are uh, raising bigger questions as well. Uh, the short version to this week, because I know people are so busy and hell, there's COVID every five minutes, it's hard to keep on top of everything. Uh, Charles Burns is a trainer who has won at Cheltenham in the past, he's a big name, and he's been banned for six months and fined a thousand euro. In effect, because his horse, Viking Horde, is the name of the horse, tested positive for a sedative at Tremor Racecourse back in October 2018. Uh, it seemed that the horse ran uh, conspicuously badly, said the report, and the rider gave it a reminder after the first uh, jump, and it uh, became rapidly detached from the rest of the field. And so there was a test carried out. The uh, A sample came back positive. Charles Burns requested a B sample. Uh, so uh, A sample tested in the UK, B sample in France. Uh, both were positive uh, for a sedative. And in fact, the concentration of the sedative in Viking Horde system was 100 times the legal limit. And the written judgment in the case made the point that the horse was subject to a dangerous degree of sedation, put the safety of the horse, the rider, and the other horses at risk. And then the betting uh, pattern, very significant here. Viking Horde started the day at 4 to 1, drifted out to a starting price of 8 to 1. 
and there were some substantial bets placed on the horse to lose. One in particular, €34,889, all to win €3,200. And there were other betting patterns when it came to Viking Horde and other races as well. Like, for instance, Sedgefield in October, €30,279 to win 12000 and it drifted that day in the betting as well. Uh, in effect, uh, it was impossible uh, for anybody to uh, prove with certainty who had nobbled the horse. So in this instance, Charles Burns was uh, found guilty of failing to supervise his horse at all times at Tremor, hence the uh, six-month suspension of his license and the fine of €1,000. And he is appealing uh, that case. So uh, Paul Kimmage is writing about the big picture. Eamon Sweeney, cheating is part of who we are, is the headline on his piece. David Walsh on the back page of the Sunday Times. Uh, a case involving a doped horse and suspicious betting patterns leaves Irish racing facing some difficult governance questions. Uh, the thrust, uh, George, of David Walsh's piece is he harks back to an investigation in 2014 where ultimately uh, the lack of CCTV cameras at Punchestown meant that the case reached a bit of a dead end and it was very hard to deduce mm -hmm. how a horse had lost its shoes. Uh, that was in 2014 and fast forward to where we are now and he makes the point without CCTV cameras in Tremor there was no way of checking what third parties had entered Viking Horde's box that day. Four years after the lack of CCTV yeah. had an impact on the investigation into Fox Rocks's two missing shoes, the same issue in this case would affect the investigation. 26 race courses in Ireland and uh, seven years after the Fox, Rocks, uh, Fox, Fox Rock case, excuse me, the only track with CCTV, for instance, is uh, Leopardstown. And there have been some big track developments in the meantime. Yeah, and uh, the, the, line, the line that David uses uh, at the end of the, the, the Fox Rock element of his piece is that uh, one might have thought that the Turf Club would since have taken action to rectify this, but obviously, if they haven't, and there's only CCTV at Leopardstown, there hasn't been a will to uh, to pursue this uh, as a as a means of, of uh, keeping track on, on what is going on. And, and obviously, then there's been another case has come up, and uh, we just don't know because uh, we're not privy to what goes on behind the scenes. And uh, everywhere else has got CCTV. Um, and in the interest of fair play, uh, would it not help if there was CCTV? Be interesting to hear the argument to say that there shouldn't be CCTV or why they haven't tried to have it installed. Because as I say, it's it, um, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Like they, they made the joke about where I used to work uh, in Belfast at the BBC when they built a big new extension, and this was in the early 1970s, of course, and it was inspired. This development was inspired by the troubles that were on at the time. That the BBC in Belfast had more television cameras outside than it had inside because it was all CCTV. So the concept of CCTV has been around since the 70s and maybe even before and here we are 50 years later uh, and the big money government funded uh, horse racing industry in Ireland uh, has only got one of its 26 race courses with CCTV cameras in it why mm. yeah and Walsh points out uh, the Curra the new redevelopment there 81 million euro uh, spent on the redevelopment at the Curra 36 million euro of which by the way taxpayer money and the cost of installing CCTV would have been 20,000 euro and it wasn't spent and in the UK every single race course obliged to have CCTV Tommy yeah I think that's that that really jumps out you know there's there's a there's a few things like that there's there's the fact that every race course in the UK is obliged to have CCTV whereas only one in Ireland has there's also some information that you know um, Paul Kimmage's piece deals with the whole issue, uh, uh, like uh, uh, the issue of Omerta, which he's of course very well qualified to write about and live. Uh... I think Tommy has frozen. Are you gone, Tommy? We'll give you a second. You might come back. Apologies, Tommy froze there. We'll come to Paul Kimmage in a second. The Walsh. Uh, piece uh, finishes, by the way, with uh, this little paragraph here. Leading trainer Jim Bulger believes doping is a problem in Irish racing. Many agree with Bulger, though they are reluctant to say so publicly. There is also a belief in Irish racing, held by many in a position to know, that within the past five years, a favourite for one of the handicaps at Cheltenham was stopped. This is at the Cheltenham Festival. No sedative was necessary, just a jockey doing as he was told. Uh, that's a hell of a paragraph to finish on, George. And, and that's almost the theme of Eamon Sweeney's piece as well. Cheating is a part of mm. who we are. And he says that uh, racing fans are more ambivalent about betting skullduggery than fans of any other sport. 
I suppose it's it's in the nature of things that uh, leaving aside the suggestion that cheating is part of what we are, uh, there is I think being in the know is part of what we are. And in horse racing, in any kind of racing, I suppose uh, greyhound racing as well. A punter likes to think that they know more than the next guy, so that they can get one up on, on the bookie and, and and make a bit of a killing. And and so there is perhaps the potential for more of a nudge, nudge, wink, wink in that sort of circumstance. Uh, whereas if, if you're betting on, on on football matches, it's a, it's a different kind of thing uh, because there is so much more out in the open and at the top level, uh, everything is so scrutinised that it would be very difficult uh, to manufacture situations where. Uh, there might be some wrongdoing that might go unnoticed, um, mm. but in the in the world of uh, I'm almost tempted to say uh, cash money, in the old way, but there was no no tracks and traces and things. That it, I suppose it, it can be very difficult to uh, to keep track of things. And as I say, in terms of the technology not being there, and uh, it's almost suggesting that there's a willingness not to keep track of things, uh, which is maybe part of the problem. Yeah, and it's one that racing will have to get on top of. Tommy, you were mentioning, uh, I think, just as we lost you there, I think it was Paul Kimmage's uh, piece, which is inside. It's on page five. The nightmare begins, he says, and he uh, mentions Lance Armstrong would never have prospered without the enablers, and so it is with racing. Mm. Uh, the, the, what did you take from Paul's yeah, piece he, today? Well, well, look, I think it's good to it's good to get the. If you haven't really been on top of the story, the, the Kimish piece, the David Walsh piece in the Sunday Times and the Eamon Sweeney piece are a nice rounded view of it. Um, the David Walsh has been on this for the last few months with different questions and, and re really serious questions that Irish racing needs to get on top of. I think the Sweeney one is really important because, as George says, you know, there's there's always been an element of, you know, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. I've got a, a bit of info from the horse's mouth here and and Sweeney kind of teases out how where is the line where that bit of Dick Francis um, skullduggery ver veers into genuine wrongdoing um, and then the, the Kimmage piece as you can imagine from his track record deals with the the Omerta side of it and, and then lays out all, all the different instances and just coming back to the issue with the CCTV not being in place in Irish courses as opposed to the UK um, you know, one of the cases he uh, he, he mentions is, is is talking about the difference in the positive, rate of positive tests between Ireland and the UK, based on the numbers released by the British Horse Racing Authority and the Irish Horse Racing Regulatory Board. An Irish trained horse was 4.7 times more likely to test positive for a banned substance in 2018 than his UK counterpart. If the comparison is restricted to national hunt racing in that year an Irish trained horse was 8.9 times more likely to test positive than a British rival. So, and, the, and these are being tested by the same lab because I, I think it was, I only found this out during the week, it might have been on your own program, Joe, that the testing was moved from an Irish lab to be centralized in new market a, a few years ago. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's all been tested, all been analyzed, sorry, in the same lab in new market. So multiple times more likely an Irish horse is to show up a positive test positive uh, test. What are the reasons for that? Um, what is racing doing about it? The question I, I, I think all this comes to a, a head is racing needs to grip the, 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 the nettle on this, grasp the nettle on this, take, take this issue, be really um, lead from the front on it in terms of the, the big people in racing. You know, Jim Bolger has come out and said this is an issue. Jim Bolger, one of the big biggest names in Irish racing, most respected trainers, has come and said, come out and said, there is a problem here. Where is the stampede of other big figures, big owners, big trainers, big breeders to come out and say, yes, we need to be squeaky clean because racing in Ireland is hugely important. It's a huge tradition, huge for the economy, huge for the rural economy. And it's a, 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 an area where we've been market leaders come out and, and don't say things like shows the evidence, come out and and be the absolute market leaders, world leaders on this, because it's it's that important to answer these questions for the for the sport in this country. Yes, because Paul Kimmage quotes Brian O'Connor of the Irish Times back in December, George, and uh, makes the point on, on Bulger, who said that doping was the number one problem in the sport. And Brian O'Connor said back in December, just imagine if Brian Cody said performance-enhancing drugs mm. were rife and hurling, or Leo Cullen claimed Leinster rugby weren't competing on a level playing field due to doping. 
the impact would be seismic, the public debate all consuming. But in racing, not a bit of it. Six weeks later, and rather than sound and fury, there's been little more than uh, silence. And he says, true to form, a sport and industry has obeyed its instincts and hunkered down to ride out the storm. I get the impression, George, that this storm isn't going away and the spotlight is firmly on the sport now. Yeah, that, I, I would be of that opinion as well, because it's, uh, I mean, Kimmy Jew's piece also refers to the dinger that was written in the, in the, uh, in the Irish field about this. But, uh, you know, it's... Um, it's something that is in the public domain now, very much in the public domain, uh, and the fact that there's a case under appeal is is keeping it in the public domain. I think, you know, it's possibly understandable that people don't like dirty linen being washed in public, but by the same token, as as uh, Tommy has said, it, it is such uh, an important part of the fabric of, of Irish, not only Irish sporting life, but Irish life, that uh, it needs to be right. Uh, I think that's the top and bottom of it, and I think... You know, Paul Kimmage and uh, David Walsh have a track record in uh, getting it right uh, and taking their investigations in the correct direction. So your point is well made. This is not going to go away. Just to um, add on to the uh, sort of a, a concluding piece from, from David Walsh on it, he, he's obviously explored the um, Viking Horde case and the, the Fox Rock case in his piece, but he ends it by referring to Jim Bulger's uh, comments. So, um, leading trainer Jim Bulger believes doping is a problem in Irish racing. Many agree with Bulger, though they are reluctant to say so publicly. There is also a belief in Irish racing held by many in a position to know that within the past five years, a favourite for one of the handicaps at the Cheltenham Festival was stopped. No sedative was necessary, just a jockey doing as he was told. Now, if, if faith, it's, it's, it's one thing, um, faith in a small race in Tremor been broken and that's very serious but if faith in the Cheltenham festival is in question here then you know this then they do have a problem yeah when your line froze i read the exact same paragraph that jumped out to me as well i mean that that's now being printed in mm. national newspapers here and in the uk you know it's 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 getting very serious so to uh, matters less complicated although uh, they concern you both i suspect uh, page 77 of the mail george i know you picked this out uh, uefa to outline yeah. own plan for elite so there's a tug of war yes. at the moment uh, george there were there were plans for a super league and we've been hearing about these for 20 30 years at this stage but it seems to be gathering pace yeah. uh, plans for a super league 15 teams closed shop 310 million pounds just to just to join another 200 plus million a season uh, Real Madrid, Juventus, Barcelona to the fore. They're inviting the English clubs. UEFA are trying to respond. Yeah, um, there's a very powerful piece. Uh, funny enough, powerful is the word in the headline. Talk about the kind of a process of association here by Sam Wallace of the Telegraph in England, which is syndicated to the, the Sunday Independent. It's just underneath the Paul Kimmage piece on page five. Uh, and he uh, outlines what's going on here, which is that uh, men in suits very powerful, wealthy men in suits are trying to uh, increase their revenue and uh, influence uh, within the small coterie of uh, the 15 big teams and to hell with football as we know it. Uh, there was something on Twitter uh, yesterday, which was a picture I, I, I saw of a Nottingham Forest fan uh, beside a banner which said, it uh, doesn't matter who uh, has the key to our club, it still belongs to us. And this is what Sam Wallace is saying. And he's also drawing attention to the fact that uh, behind the suggestion of Project Big Picture, uh, in, where the Premier League clubs were going to offer trickle-down money to the, the lower divisions, this is all predicated upon the fact that the Premier League is going to lose income because the TV rights will all be swallowed up by this big new European Super League. So when Project Big Picture, which involves a trickle-down of money to smaller clubs, comes into being, these guys are backing the Backing, betting on the fact that they won't in fact have a big pot to trickle down out of because the Premier League rights will have diminished. And if that is the case, I mean, that all the domestic leagues across Europe are going to suffer because of this if it ever comes to pass, which I personally doubt it will because UEFA, I have, sorry I haven't asked, answered your question as to what they're proposing. They're going to revamp the Champions League from 2024, which we may get to discuss in a moment. But I think that the, the point is that uh, Sam Wallace says a, a, a relentless serving of Bayern Munich against Benfica from here to eternity is not what the football paying fan wants. And the thrust of his piece is how many people actually want this Super League? And it's the 200 or so big men in suits with big wallets. 
They're the ones who want it. And the millions of football fans across the nations don't. If I might just end, end this particular statement, if you like, uh, by, by, by drawing a comparison with what it was like when I, I, I did a year in Germany as, a, as a, an English language teacher, uh, and I followed the football. I was based in the Ruhr. Bayern Munich, who are now uh, cast iron certainties to win the Bundesliga every year. What's that for competition? Bayern Munich, I was at the game where they lost the Bundesliga when they needed to win, and they were beaten by a team called MSV Duisburg. Uh, and they lost 2-0. It was all in place that they were going to win the league, but they didn't that day. They lost it, and Mönchengladbach won the league. Where are Mönchengladbach now? Well, they beat Dortmund the other night, but they're not challenging Bayern Munich. Dortmund aren't even challenging Bayern Munich. Who is challenging? Leipzig. Leipzig, with all their money, are the team that are challenging Bayern Munich. And so if, if that's the way it's going, the, the fans are just going to melt away because it, it won't be the game that they follow. And, and it's, it's sad, but I, as I say, I don't think it'll come to pass because UEFA very, very, very aware of where the money might end up, will want to hold on to it themselves and the control of it themselves. And they're going to revamp uh, the Champions League, it said, from 2024, according to the, the Mail on Sunday with a, with a different kind of Champions League uh, that, that will retain the latter stages of the competition as it is, uh, but will revamp it at the start uh, on a rather complicated seating system uh, so as to have more matches uh, and uh, end up with a, a better competition. Yeah, what they're, what they're planning for 2024 is 36 teams. Uh, teams will play 10 games in what's known as the Swiss system, first device for a chess tournament in Switzerland against opponents of varying strengths based on seeding. So you'll play your 10 games, and then the top 12 teams will go to uh, last 16 with another four slots being settled with playoffs, and then on they go to knockout stages. So. Uh, uh, 10 games in the group stages, so something akin to a league. Tommy, I don't know, do you like the sound of that in 2024? Um, the, the thing is, I think it's irrelevant whether we like the sound of it or not, because there's forces that are shaping football and have been shaping professional football for the last 30-odd years, which don't really care what we think and don't, and don't really care what, what, what the fans think. I mean, it was Silvio Berlusconi sat watching um, Real Madrid play Napoli in the... 1989 European Cup first round and couldn't understand why you had two of the biggest teams in Europe and one of them was going to be knocked out of the competition in, in September when he could sell, you know, his on his TV company, he could sell, you know, subscriptions and, and cable packages till the cows come home if he could have this every week. So he was one of the, you know, that's where it all sort of started and, and the Champions League and Premier League and 35 years later, here we are. Um, this competition, what, what's, good, there's, what's going on here, to my mind, over the last couple of years and over the last decade or so, is constant game of brink, brinksmanship between the leading European clubs and UEFA. So every time UEFA renew the structure of the Champions League, the leading clubs, the European Club Association, threaten to break away, and UEFA in turn, to keep them happy, give them a little bit more. So the most recent Champions League, the one format we're under now all the none of the top um four leagues none of the top five leagues uh, have to qualify have to play qualifying rounds they all get automatic places there's less room for the teams from so-called smaller countries etc etc and a bigger slice of the financial pie so every few years you get this brinksmanship goes on and this is just the latest installment and what and because this plan by the the, the big clubs has got has gone so far this time UEFA are clearly feeling that they have to come back with something really revolutionary and mm. the single 36 team league. And what it's going to do is shift the balance less away from domestic leagues, more of these elite, so called elite games that, you know, Sam Wallace talks about the Bayern Munich against Benfica. And, and the idea is weakening the domestic leagues. The longer game being, all these big clubs want to have a situation where. European soccer is a bit like the NFL, where it's a massive 400 million population market, big clubs in all the big cities, and they carve up the spoils. And 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 in in 30 years' time, we might be vaguely remembering things like the FA Cup and you know the League Cup and things like that would be distant history. Yeah. Well, I got to say, the 2024 Champions League situation sounds miserable to me. Ten <laughs> ten game. 
a season before they even get into knockouts. Like we're, we, so we're currently at what three by two. We're currently at six uh, group games. That's plenty for me to go back to ten. I mean, hey, geez. listen, if it, keep, if it keeps me in gainful employment, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you're about to like, bring back two group stages. Says Hamilton. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. More no, there. it's it. it Tommy, Tommy, Tommy's right. Tommy's right. There's nothing uh, anybody's going to be able to do about this because uh, big bucks are going to talk at the end of the day. And what we're seeing are the two two bulldozers uh, getting ready to charge at each other. Uh, the, the 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 Super League on one side and UEFA on the other. And UEFA has managed to retain the upper hand by adjusting its product over the years, and and will probably do so on this occasion. But uh, I would foresee what Tommy foresees as well, which which is uh, the Americanization of European Association football, uh, and goodness knows where that will leave uh, the League of Ireland. Mm. Yeah, well, that's another point as well. So, uh, Tommy, you wanted to mention Tom Brady. Yeah, I just wanted to mention it. It's um, actually, just to harp back again to yesterday's Irish Times, where Keith Duggan had a really good piece about Tom Brady in it. Um, well worth um, ha having a look at, if you, if you can. Um, there's just a little piece in the Sunday Times by Josh Glancy today, who's their Washington correspondent, I think. Uh, it's not particularly a standing piece. It's kind of a lot of rehashing a lot of the same stuff about um uh, brady that we but that that we know but i'm definitely going to sit down and watch this tonight because i got i really really hit me i was there reading this this morning and, it, and he says i'll pause for a moment here and ask all the 43 year olds out there reading this over a hearty breakfast hello 43 year old reading it over a hearty breakfast uh, to put themselves in Brady's shoes, imagine picking up a ball and running at a ball of five monstrous 300-pound gym fanatics, most of them two decades younger than you, determined to crush your bones into powder. Imagine you've already got $100 million in the bank and six Super Bowl rings and a property portfolio to rival Donald Trump. Imagine still wanting more. Brady's resolve borders on the manic. Now, as a 43-year-old who it took all my resolve to go out and get the papers this morning... <laughs> It's 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 quite a testament to the guy, so I'll definitely tune in this evening. Uh, so yeah. above that, by the way, there's a, I think it's a brilliant read. I think it's one of the best reads of the uh, weekend. Peter Riley, uh, Ross McCarran. I, I suspect somewhere along the way, Ross must have told his story uh, before, but I, I don't remember it in too much depth. Uh, so uh, McCarran is the guy who walked away from Leinster. You know, he uh, had the offer of a contract there, or certainly had a year left in his contract, and just, it wasn't for him. Um, 23 years of age, this was in 08, just as Leinster were on the verge of conquering Europe, says Peter O'Reilly. Uh, and Peter, by the way, as, as a tangent, uh, given where we're headed in sport generally and the finances involved, his story should be of particular interest to the 90 or so rugby players whose agents are presently in contractual negotiations with the IRFU and David Nusifora, because according to sources, the budget for players' salaries is down by 20% on last season. No three-year deals are being offered, and if you're lucky enough to be offered a two-year deal, the second season comes with a non-negotiable COVID clause attached, which gives the union an opt-out clause if crowds are below 75% capacity by 2022 Six Nations. Try getting a mortgage with a one-year contract as your only security. So that's the current state of play. But McCarran is 36 now, a uh, really good prospect, Gonzaga, Irish schools, Leinster Academy, Irish under 19s, Irish under 21s. There's a Keith Gleason try against Ospreys on YouTube, January 07, where you'll see him. And as Mark Robson, the commentator, says, I'll tell you what, there's some cracking youngsters coming through uh, this Leinster side when you look at McCarran, Sexton, and Carney. Uh, that was his second game, he tells uh, Peter O'Reilly. Michael Checker was the coach then. He says, Checker gave out to me for not feeding Dennis Hickey to my right. That was his unique way of doing things giving out to you even when you've done something good. And he talks about Cheka being school of hard knocks. When you were injured, it was not a good place to be. You were self-conscious. It so drained on your confidence. Cheka was not exactly uh, giving you high fives when you passed him in the corridor if you were injured. And it all came to a head after a game against Glasgow where he didn't play that well. And Cheka told him he wanted to sit down and write down everything he had done badly. And uh, Ross McCarran thinks to himself, I'm thinking, F this, I'm supposed to be playing a game tomorrow. I don't want all the confidence knocked out of me by writing down all the things I've done wrong. So he jumped in the car with a few lads to get some lunch, and uh, in the car he sent his girlfriend a text just slaughtering Cheka and how he says himself, it was a brutal text message, this guy's an idiot, I hate him, etc. I was on an old Nokia, which prompted me to send a text to my most recent contact, 
Michael Checker. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I pressed OK by mistake. I'll never forget that feeling. My heart dropped to the bottom of my stomach. The lads came back into the car. I was white as a sheet. I told them what I'd done. And one of them, I won't say who, says, where's Checker now? He was training with the seniors. Then he says, where's his phone? We headed back to Riverview as quickly as we could. I, like the tension. Uh, my friend yeah. kept lookout. I burst into Checker's office. I found his phone under some papers. It said, one new message, sender, Ross McCarran. That was the one message he never received. <laughs> and uh, and crisis, crisis averted. But ultimately, uh, yeah. he walked away. He said, I was, vir I was virtually, virtually uh, verging on depressed with all the injuries, uh, a jaw injury. It felt like Checker couldn't trust me. Uh, Fitzgerald Carney coming through and uh, he walked away to the shock of his dad, his girlfriend, um, but a massive weight off my shoulders at 23. Um, really interesting, George. Yeah, uh, it, it, I find that a fascinating piece because um, if I'd com completely forgotten that he was in that league with the Johnny Sexons and, and the Rob Carney, that he, he was a coming man and, he, and he'd gone, so much has happened since. But, uh, you know, he... he he, he also makes the point to how bad he felt when they were winning the, the Heineken Cup uh, and, and he, was, he wasn't part of it. These were the guys he played with and how up, upset at the time he was. But, but now he's, he's happy that he did what he did. He finished his education. He got himself into a good job. He's into a better job now. Uh, and his, his little boy's now at the, the Lansdowne uh, Mini Rugby. So the, the, the wheel has turned full circle uh, and, and maybe it'll be even more full circle by the time that little boy uh, gets to be playing senior rugby because... The point you made at the start there, and the point that Peter O'Reilly makes at the start, and I have been wondering about this uh, in the circumstances, uh, whether professional rugby uh, in the times that we're in, uh, and that's very stark, isn't it? When you Rob Carney's gone to Australia, uh, the other guys are negotiating contracts, 92 of them, 92 of them looking for contracts, and they're not really going to get much satisfaction. It's a terrible place to be in, but I, it's, it's you know, Ross McCarran has, has come out of it well in the end because he took a decision way back then. Um, professional sports, uh, not at the elitist of elite levels, is a difficult place to be in these days. And that seemed to be his thinking, Tommy. Like, do I want to be a journeyman here and, and mm. suddenly be looking to start a new life at the age he is now, which is 36 or so? Although you can imagine, as, as George referenced, he said uh, one day in the office, a motivational speaker came to the office. He's shown us pictures of Leinster with the Heineken Cup. And I do remember at that point thinking, this is seriously grim. I think it was a really, it's a really wistful piece, you know. It's 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 not coming out and saying, I, I'd never regret it for a moment. Clearly, some of the some of the quotes, he, he he's he's got little pangs of, mm, did I make the right decision? You know, he mentions that situation where he's sitting watching his mates uh, lifting the the the, the, um, the Heineken Cup. Um, then he says at the end, you know, did I make the right decision leaving Leinster? There's no doubt it was the right thing for me to do at the time. Maybe I should have looked into another province when there was that opportunity. But having said that, I'm very happy where I am now. There's just a lovely little light and shade there between, you know, he, he can't help, probably can't help looking back and thinking maybe I should have. But then at the time, I was sure I wanted to. And it's something we can all relate to. Maybe we, we all look back at moments and kind of gone, was that the right thing to do then? And... You know, it's just a really kind of human story. It's not the story of the guy who who bounced back and won the cup. You know, or sometimes you read stories about guys who who nearly gave it up and but stuck at it and 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 won. You know, became a champion. This guy kind of just went off into into obscurity, and um, mm. it's it's just an interesting to tone uh, to the piece. Totally, I, it's a complicated tone. I wouldn't have enjoyed it as much if he had said it was definitely the right decision. No regrets whatsoever. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, how can he, how can he know? You know, and that's that's for all of us. A question for you both, George. If you weren't in the media, what would you be doing? Oh, that's interesting. Um, and coming from straight out of the left field, I have no idea what to say. I think I might well have gone travelling into some capacity or other, uh, and I might have ended up um, back in that classroom teaching yeah. in Germany. Yeah, Tommy Martin. God, I haven't a clue. <laughs> well, I, I did have a proper job. I, 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 I was the guy in the office um, where, where Ross McCarran was, and and and, and left us for the uh, not exactly uh, bright lights. Yeah, I was going to say not particularly lucrative, not particularly glamorous, <laughs> but uh, much more enjoyable world than, than I'm in now. So, right. What office job were you? And I didn't really, I didn't really never talked to you about that before. Yeah, I worked um, after I left college. Uh, I did an arts degree, uh, I did a degree in history and politics. 
so obviously I was going to go and work in a bank after that. Um, so yeah, it was sorry Celtic Tiger time and um, worked in in sort of finance and banking for for a few years and um, eventually decided that my talents were were wanted elsewhere in the world of international commerce. And was it a life is too short, this is boring approach? Yeah. Yeah, it was. It was. I, I, I always remember sitting at my desk, looking out the window, going, thinking that my life was happening somewhere else. It wasn't happening here. You know, I, I just real kind of out of body experience, and I, you know, I had to. And I was kind of one of those people who was like, "Yeah, I work in, I work in the bank, but really, what I want to do is, is this." And then I realized I was becoming. I, I needed to actually do something about it. So, mm. you know, it was one of those kind of jump, do you know, make the make the leap now or. Forever. Piss or get off the pot. Yeah, forever, <laughs> for, for, forever for, hold your peace. Yeah. yeah, I think Dave McIntyre was the same. Yeah. Banking as well, and he mm. thought, so, this, so, yeah. this ain't happening." Banking's loss. Well, indeed, <laughs> indeed, indeed, indeed. Um, uh, one last quick piece or two to mention: I, I, the ban and beyond. Uh, Dennis Walsh, page fourteen of the Sunday Times. I think everyone's pretty familiar with the ban. Uh, Rule twenty-seven in existence for more than sixty years, and uh, just throws in a few anecdotes of. Uh, the ban, in effect, kicks off with the famous one, Aileen Brady at 15, going off to play for Ireland against Wales, and he was a pupil in St. Aidan's, a Christian British school, and he went off anyway, and they threatened expulsion. It wasn't an idle threat. And then, from page of the Evening Herald a few days later, Christian brother expels boy for playing soccer, and the head brother issued a denial in the paper, but the sanction stood. And we have uh, Shea Given's father, I hadn't realised, George, Seamus Given, uh, so he was uh, sneaking in and out of soccer matches in Donegal, changing in a car, and effectively been smuggled in and out, as was Brian McAniff as yeah. well. Yeah, they were they were strange times back then, of course. Um, my dear late colleague Jimmy McGee had a, a great yarn when he was still living on the Cooley Peninsula and uh, the countryside, and he would catch the bus uh, and he would hide his football boots because he was going to play football, association football, as opposed to uh, Gaelic football. And he was uh, at the bus stop, awaiting the bus with his boots in a paper bag so that it wouldn't be known where he was headed. But uh, there was this elderly neighbor, a lady uh, leaning over the gate who knew fine well where he was headed. And he said, there you go now, McGee, there you go again. Off to play your soccer. <laughs> 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 Jimmy used to love telling that story. Those were the days when he worked in, when he worked in a day job before he took the leap into, yeah. uh, into broadcasting. But yeah, no, he, he, he got great mileage out of that story. Wow, was, uh, was but no, that's the no way joke. it was, yeah. and uh, yeah. Uh, Tralee Dynamos mentions uh, Dennis here to give you a little sense of the atmosphere. The only soccer team in Kerry, they played in the Limerick League. In the last years of the band, so I think the band ended in 71, the last years of the band, they suffered their share of harassment. Every so often, broken glass would be spread on their pitch on the night before a home match, and a couple of times their goalposts were sawed down. It was vandalism by a mindless few touting the GAA as their badge. And then as soon as the ban lifted, suddenly eight teams mushroomed up because there was an interest there, Tommy. Um, yeah, like the, the anecdotes, obviously, you mentioned the Liam Brady one um, and Brian McAniff is mentioned as well, are, are quite, quite, kind of quite well known. But it was, it's a really enjoyable piece um, to have them to sort of uh, explored a bit more. But uh, the, the shameless given one, it, it kind of um, illustrates a sort of a uh, wacky races kind of um, cannonball run type atmosphere around playing soccer at the time. So Given was playing inter-county football um, with Donegal at the time. There was no soccer league in Donegal, but in towns and villages around the county, there was a thriving calendar of summer cup comp competitions. So one August evening, when Given was having his dinner, a priest arrived at his door in convoy, um, accompanied by Liam McGlinchey from the local garage. Arnmore Island had reached the final of the Convoy Cup, but their goalkeeper was stuck at sea on a fishing vessel and they needed an instant solution. Given agreed to play on condition that he could be smuggled in and out of the ground without being seen. So he togged out at home and climbed into the boot of a Ford Cortina Mark II. Arnmore won scooping the first prize of £700 and Given was man of the match. He left the same way he had arrived, hidden like a stowaway. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting, Just there's a great line from, from Brian McIniff, who played for Cork Hibs in the League of Ireland under an assumed name. I mean, like, honestly, did they, did, I mean, obviously it was probably well known at the time, but as, as Dennis Walsh writes, um, suspending somebody like McIniff, who was 
Donegal's best player at the time simply wouldn't have been in their best interests. Eventually, the ban is overturned. And then um, McIniff quits soccer. He says, I think when the ban went, uh, the fun went out of it too. So it's kind of a... <laughs> It's kind of mad. It's, it's, kind like, of it's like an affair. Yeah, yeah, yeah there you go. There, okay. Um, Dennis Walsh, page 17 of the Times. We're, we're pretty much out of time. I just want to, I'm going to mention this briefly and then I might ask you both for a thought on uh, any Liverpool United pieces that grabbed you. But uh, people are interested in what's going on in Kilkenny at the moment. So Colin Fenley is gone. Dennis Walsh, very well sourced uh, journalist often. And he's saying uh, it is known that there were tensions between. Colin Fenley and Brian Cody during last year's championship. The first training session after the Liverpool final, Cody took Fenley and Walter Welch to one side, reportedly gave them a piece of his mind. Uh, Fenley was then on the bench for the Waterford game. He came on when there was a point in it, didn't do anything to turn the tide. Um, obviously, there's no reason or, or statement given on uh, Fenley's behalf as to why he's taken just the year out. But uh, later on, Dennis Walsh writes, for the first time, local confidence in Cody to bring Kilkenny back is not unanimous on the ground on various wavelengths. The persistent word from Nolan Park is that Kilkenny's preparation is not as good as it needs to be, which is an interesting line. Last year's championship, they were on the end of a 16-point swing against Dublin, 14-point swing against uh, Waterford. It's understood a recent approach was made to Henry Shefflin and Richie O'Neill to come on board as coaches. So a uh, few bits and bobs happening behind the scenes there. I'm sure Brian Cody had point to a Leinster win against uh, Galway and the semi-final win against Limerick the year before that is a sign that things are just fine, but uh, rumblings of uh, sorts on page 17 of the Sunday Times. Uh, Manchester United, just thought, so, uh, sorry George, yeah? So I've, I've just thought, wanted to throw into the into the ring there the, the thought that every time I read about this about Brian Cody, I can't help thinking about Mickey Hart. Yeah. And the parallels perhaps there uh, in what, what happens when somebody's been so successful and so dominant in charge for so long. Uh, and quite possibly those underneath are not the same people who were there when they began. Uh, and there's a new kind of cadre of, of committee men and women who are maybe of a different mind. I don't know. I don't know. It's just, but it, I can't help seeing the parallel between Brian Cody and uh, Mickey Hart. Yeah, I could certainly drift more firmly into that dynamic if Cody stays on and these stories keep appearing. But I don't know, Tommy, like the Limerick semi final two years ago, even the Leinster final win just gone and he's working with a lesser group I think we would, mm. without any disrespect intended I mean it, it, it's very easy to start grumbling and saying what have you done for me lately Brian I've seen the, the, I've seen this piece uh, in various guises over the last few weeks it certainly seems to be the big talking point around the, around the hurling world over this winter and I, I don't think it's mentioned in, in this piece it may, maybe maybe I'm um, getting pieces mixed now but the, I think it is actually um, the whole issue of, of had this been a normal winter, then there may have been more of a push to make to make bigger changes. In other words, if, if Kilkenny had have been out of an All-Ireland in August, a long winter of, of time for somebody new to come in and change things. But now, maybe it's kind of felt like, well, now is definitely not the right time to do anything, if you're going to do anything. Um, but certainly there seems to be, I've never seen this amount of, and it's all it's all told this way, rumblings, yeah. um, whispers. <laughs> you know, it's it's like some Soviet uh, dictator and the, the rest of the Politburo are you know are wondering if, if his time is up. But nobody's nobody's going to come out and go go on the pages of Pravda and and call for his head. So yeah, and I I think part of that, and it was well actually I'm basing this more on the Tyrone situation is anyone who might be in the mix for the job had played under Hart in the main. And so mm. they did not want to be the person who had pushed him out because of everything he had done for the county. And same with Cody. Do you want to be the person who's yeah. push, pushing Cody off? You know, yeah. that's, that, that will be divisive and messy. So Who I, wants to be the Moyes to, uh, to, to well, Cody's Ferguson? Yeah. That too, that too. Anything in the United yeah. Liverpool coverage, George? Grab your eye. I, well, I, I like to have Sunas in the Times suggesting that it's Liverpool's midfield that's the problem. You know, forget the lack of goals of the Van Dyke void. It's the engine room that Liverpool really need to fix. And he kind of puts his finger on the fact that Fabinho's had to fill in at the back and Thiago's been hurt. That, 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 that's where the problem lies. That's what he sees as the problem being for Liverpool. And I also like the one about the, uh, Manchester United have a, a you know a, a plan in place. Did Alex Ferguson have a plan? I can't remember which paper I saw that one in. I think it might have been the Indo, wasn't it? That, that, uh, does Ole have a plan or has he just ended up at the top by chance? Mm. I thought that was rather good. 
That that was, I think, the Jonathan Wilson piece, was it? That's the one. Um, that's the one. That's yeah. exactly the one. Yeah. I've got, I've got United, my pages all mixed up here. I can't yeah, find it's it. hard to keep track. The United thing is is interesting because you get the sense of all the the football analysts and writers and stuff scratching their heads trying to figure out how United are top of the league and you know against everything that they were taught they were saying what four mm. five six weeks ago that it doesn't seem to make sense and maybe in this season nothing makes sense and Jonathan Wilson yeah. who's you know who who literally wrote the book about tactics and philosophies in football um his piece in the observer which is syndicated in the sunday endo is suggesting that maybe against modern trends which say you have to have this very strict philosophy like guardiola or club have maybe this season united with a team that don't particularly have a strong particular philosophy in any in any specific way they're doing well because uh, as he says at United, meanwhile, as a club unwedded to a philosophy, the emphasis is far more on individuals and moments. The structures are less complex, the more traditional qualities of motivation and unity more important. That is contrary to the direction of most modern tactical thought, but this season it may prove an advantage. So, yeah. I don't know whether that's... Uh, I, wasn't sure, I wasn't sure I even bought that. I don't know how Benitez and Julio fitted into this great um, tradition at Liverpool, but anyway, it was it was interesting nonetheless um we gotta go we gotta go trevor texted in i don't suspect you'd get an answer trevor who does george hamilton support <laughs> oh arsenal oh do you so you're, you're allowed to be open about yeah. these things oh, oh, okay no, good no no see, no i'm not allowed but i'll do it anyway all right um, good. it's um, <laughs> it's an open secret it's open, open secret. secret it's arsenal okay why was that who hooked you yeah, in so i'm very familiar. Uh, it's a family thing that goes right back to when i was a kid and um the family uh, arsenal was in the family and it seemed like the logical thing to do and then they went and won the double and um why not and so here i am suffering through this sure strange season yeah um while uh, manchester united and liverpool go merrily on but it just struck me listening there to the last uh, uh judge there between the period um the champions league don't want the big teams to go out berlusconi didn't want the big teams to go out the fa cup's gonna lose manchester united or liverpool yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. But at least it gives us something to watch this afternoon, so I'll take it. That's absolutely right. Uh, fellas, listen, really enjoyed that. I've enjoyed this uh, RTE Virgin Media off-the-ball news talk coming together. We will uh, resume hostilities now. So, uh, George Hamilton and Tommy Martin, thanks so much, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having us. Cheers. Thank, thank you. Sure. Bye. The Sunday Papers on Off the